This is the topic on mountain building, deformation, and earthquakes. Here is some vocabulary to start off. You have the word orogeny. That is an episode of large scale mountain building that involves deformation and metamorphism. Usually also you have igneous activity involved as well as crustal thickening. And orogenies are resulting from crustal collisions. So you have pieces of crust that collide. And we started discussing that when we did the metamorphic chapter. For example, India colliding into Asia, and that resulted in a thicker crustal area that is the Himalayan mountains, which involves a lot of deformation and metamorphism, as well as igneous activity. A mountain technically is at least 300 meters higher than its surroundings and it has a restricted summit area. That's in contrast to, for example, a plateau, which could be 300 meters high, but it's a flat area that's higher up. So a mountain has a restricted summit, like it, it reaches a point. And a mountain range or a mountain belt is a line of mountains. And this map shows mountain belts around the world. And you see the different colors. So you have young mountain belts, which are less than 100 million years old. That's in this pink color. Then this purple periwinkle color is old mountain belts. And that is what we're focusing on today. Shields and platforms we will discuss in a later chapter. So you can see the Appalachian Mountains, the Andes Mountains, the Alps, the Himalayas. These are some of the mountains that we discussed last week. And we will continue to discuss in this lecture as well. So in the last lecture on plate tectonics, we focused on mountain belts that formed as volcanic arcs related to subduction. For example, the Andes Mountains, most, most of which are volcanic. So in this lecture, we will focus on mountain belts that formed from collisions between land masses. So these types of mountains would be called collisional mountains. Okay, so it's a little bit different from what we discussed, like the Andes Mountains, which again is caused by subduction and the formation of volcanic arcs. So Andes Mountains are not the same type of mountain as let's say the Himalayan Mountains, where you have India colliding into Asia. So we're going to focus more on the Himalayan type mountain, which is a collisional mountain. Okay, so there's a difference in the type of mountain here. So collisional mountain belts result from events called orogenies. Orogenies can occur as a result of the following events. If volcanic island arcs collide with continental crust, or if two pieces of continental crust collide. But again, just a reminder, this is a different type of mountain building than, let's say, the Andes Mountains. Okay? The Andes Mountains is a line of volcanic mountains related to subduction. It's a volcanic arc. Collisional mountains are when you're having a collision between two pieces of land. So the picture on top shows you a microcontinent and a volcanic island arc, and they're being carried toward a subduction zone. 
So here you have the crust over here, which is continental crust because it's thicker. And then here is your ocean crust. And you have a subduction zone here. And then you have the magma formation and the magma is rising up and forming these volcanic mountains, which is your volcanic arc. Here is your ocean trench. Here is an inactive island arc that they added to the diagram to show the next step. And then here is a microcontinent. Okay, so like, again, this is like the Andes Mountains. Okay, these are not collisional mountains, part of an orogeny. These are just island arc, not island arc, sorry, volcanic arc mountains. Okay, so then you're going to see as the subduction occurs and continues, this ancient island arc is going to collide with this piece of continental crust. And then eventually, as the subduction continues, this microcontinent is going to collide with this piece of continental crust as well. And then you have your formation of collisional mountains. Okay, so that's step two here. The accretion of the microcontinent to the continental margin shoves the remnant island arc further inland and grows the continental margin seaward. So that just means you're adding on to the coast of this continental piece here. And you're making it thicker and you're growing it out further into the ocean. So the coastline used to be here, now the coastline is here. That's what that means. Now the term accretion means joining or adding on to. So, whoops, let's just add joining or adding onto. Okay, and then here is your mountain range and it's collisional mountains and this is an orogeny. Okay, again, resulting from these pieces of land colliding with this continent. So this is orogenies where volcanic island arcs collide with continental crust. Continuing with what we were just talking about, how you had this island arc colliding with the continent. Just that piece we're going to focus on for a minute. Okay, so here you have a cross section of Eastern North America. Here is a continental crust piece. Here is the ocean crust extending out. And then you have subduction and a formation of a volcanic island arc. And then this was actually about four, 543 million years ago. So you had an active volcano or a volcanic arc out in the ocean off the coast of North America. And this is, we have evidence of this in New York City. For example, in Orchard Beach in the Bronx, we have evidence of this happening. You have these types of rocks in a previous lecture, I showed you some black rocks and you had some students standing on some rocks and then the black rock was like lower down and a lot of it turned into black sand. And we talked about the difference in weathering rates. That black rock that most of it broke down to sand was amphibolite related to the mafic rocks that you see in this situation here. And that picture was from Orchard Beach in the Bronx. Okay, so again, continental crust, ocean crust, subducting, and forming this 
volcanic island arc where you have a collision with another piece of ocean crust. Then here, about 500 million years ago, you have the subduction has consumed much of that ocean crust. You have a more substantial volcanic island arc. You have less of this ocean crust. So now the volcanic island arc is almost colliding with the continental crust. But then also you have this sediment that has accumulated in between. And that sediment came from the scraping off of ocean sediments from the subducting plate. And we call that the accretionary wedge. The accretionary wedge is that, that sediment right here. So this shows you the tectonic orogeny. Okay, this is all a representation of the tectonic orogeny. And that resulted from this island arc colliding with what we now call North America. So then later, about 440 million years ago, that volcanic island arc fully collided with ancestral North America, this continental crust, and the sediment from that accretionary wedge, as well as the rocks that made up the volcanic arc, all got into this orogeny situation and you had metamorphism. So now you created, you have the uh, marble, you have amphibolite, you have gneiss and schist, all these different types of metamorphic rocks, which you can actually see in places like Manhattan and the Bronx in New York City. So the formation of the Taconic Mountains, those would have been a tall mountain range similar to, let's say, the Himalayan mountains. Okay, it would have been a very large mountain range, and those were the Taconic Mountains. Now, these mountains have since eroded away, leaving just their roots, so you're able to actually walk on metamorphic rocks that form deep in a mountain. So these Taconic Mountains have eroded away. We don't have them anymore. We just have the remnants deep down, what used to be deep down inside that mountain. But that's how the mountains formed 440 million years ago, approximately. So that is the first type of orogeny, a volcanic island arc colliding with continental crust. And here is a diagram that shows you the timeline. So here's 510 million years ago. This is the island arc that we're calling the Taconic Arc. Okay, so that's the volcanic island arc. This is ancestral North America. And then 470 million years ago, the Taconic Island Arc is now moved, has now moved closer to North America. Now also though, keep in mind, this is 30 degrees south and this is the equator. Okay, so at this time, North America was in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so we're, we're south of the equator. Okay, so here, the Taconic Arc has moved closer to North America. And then here, about 450 million years ago, it is now accreted or collided with North America. And if you look closely, you can see the outline of the different states. You see the states in here. 
and you can see the provinces in Canada. So it's, you can see like where different, lo different areas in North America today were back then. And then here's another diagram showing you what happened. So again, about 600 million years ago, you had the Taconic Volcanic Arc here. Here is ancestral North America. And eventually you're going to consume all of this ocean crust in the subduction and you're gonna have a collision between this tectonic volcanic arc and North America, okay? But at the same time, if you look all the way over here, you had Africa and you had this microcontinent called Avalonia. And then you had this subduction here. Okay, so then we move on to about 450 million years ago, where the taconic orogeny has now occurred. Okay, and you can see the green here. This green here represents the volcanic island arc, is now collided with North America. And then you have Avalonia and Africa. So then a second episode of mountain building called the Acadian orogeny occurred about 350 million years ago. It involved the collision of a microcontinent called Avalonia with North America. Okay, so after this subduction zone continued and consumed this ocean crust, eventually Avalonia collided with the land that already experienced the taconic orogeny. So now Avalonia is on this ancestral North American coastline. So then you can see the color here is like a, a purplish, pinkish color, whatever color that is. You could see that now that it is smushed onto North America, they maintained the same color in the diagram. Okay, so about 350 million years ago, you have Avalonia has collided with North America and you formed a second orogeny, the Acadian orogeny. Okay, so that was all involving volcanic island arcs colliding with continental crust. Referring to the, the taconic volcanic arc, okay? Avalonia colliding with North America and forming the Acadian orogeny is more related to this type of orogeny where you have continental to continental plate boundaries. The Himalayas are the best example that we have today to discuss, and that's when India collided with the rest of Asia. Initially, it was an oceanic to continental boundary, and the ancient volcanic arc that was formed is now part of modern day Tibet. Okay, so here's your continental crust, your subduction, at this collision with the rest of the continental crust over here, which is Asia. Okay, so this is India, that's Asia, and you formed a volcanic arc on the continent of Asia. This is similar to like the Andes Mountains today. Okay, but then eventually India collided with Asia after you consumed all of this ocean crust and formed the Himalayan mountains. So that's your second type of orogeny, the continental to continental collision. Okay, so just going back, where's the slide? 
Orogenies can occur as a result of the following events. If volcanic island arcs collide with continental crust, that would be like the taconic orogeny. And if two pieces of continental crust collide, that would be like the Himalayan mountains. Okay, so this is like the taconic orogeny. And then we have two pieces of continental crust colliding, would be like the Himalayan mountains. Okay. And also Avalonia colliding with North America would be the two pieces of continental crust as well. Like in this diagram here, Avalonia colliding with ancestral North America. Okay, so that would be that second example as well. Okay, so we talked about the Himalayan mountains. Now, this is another diagram showing you the timeline. So 71 million years ago, India was down here. And then about 10 million years ago, India was here. And then your present day, India is here and it is colliding with the Eurasian plate and forms the Himalayan mountains or formed them. And they're continuing to grow, like they're continuing to develop. So our local example of collisions between two pieces of continental crust would include the orogeny that formed the Appalachian Mountains. So the final event of what we call the Alleghenian orogeny that formed the Appalachian Mountains occurred between 250 and 300 million years ago. That is when Africa collided with North America. So the result was the formation of the Appalachian Mountains, perhaps once as majestic as the Himalayas. The Appalachians lay in the interior of the newly assembled supercontinent called Pangaea. So let's look back at these diagrams here. Okay, so we have North America. Then you had this green area here was the Taconic Orogeny. Then here you have the Acadian Orogeny. And then you have this subduction so eventually this ocean crust was consumed in the subduction process and Africa then eventually collided into ancestral North America, adding on to this land that was part of the Acadian orogeny. Okay, so Africa kept moving this way during the subduction and eventually they collided these two pieces of land collided. And that led to this diagram here. Okay, so you have the Acadian, the Taconic. Here is the piece of North America that is, that was the original piece before the Taconic volcanic island arc collided, before Avalonia collided right? That's North America. And now here you're seeing Africa collided with North America. Okay, so then that caused the Alleghenian orogeny, and that is the Appalachian Mountains.
So mountains that form as a result of an orogeny or a collision have the following features. They contain a lot of sediment and sedimentary rocks that have been folded and faulted. They show evidence of regional metamorphism and they show evidence of igneous activity with large bodies of magma underground. In other words, plutons. So we're really going back to a few of the previous lectures that we had. This incorporates the plate tectonics lecture. It incorporates the sedimentary, the metamorphic, and the igneous chapters as well. Then we have this term, terrains. Terrains are pieces of exotic crust that have been added to continents. These pieces of land can include island arcs and small crustal pieces, such as microcontinents, similar to present-day Madagascar, or similar to Avalonia, which I showed you a minute ago. And these pieces get accreted onto or added onto continents. And then they stay there. So on the west coast of the United States, going up into Canada and then Alaska, you have all of these pieces of different colors. So this red color is oceanic terrains. The blue is the areas deformed by the accretion of terrains. And the other colors are accreted terrains. Okay, so you have lots of different pieces here that came from elsewhere and they got added onto the coast over time during different collisions. Here is some terrains in New England. Okay, and this is that diagram with Avalonia. So Avalonia is shown in this darker shaded color, the, uh, the darker gray. So that's actually your terrain that was added onto New England but that land used to be from somewhere else, okay? It used to be a separate piece, but now it's been added to the rest of North America. But that's a terrain because it came from somewhere else. So then we're gonna look at the anatomy of a mountain belt. Mountains contain thick roots that project far below the ground, similar to ice cubes and icebergs, where only like part of the ice is above the water, and then the rest of the ice is below water. Okay, so like part of the mountain range is projected upward where you could see it, but you do have this very large root that pushes down into the mantle. So these mountains are very thick, but a lot of it is actually below ground pushing into the mantle. This kind of also reminds me of like a tooth. Your tooth sticks up out of your root, out of your gums, but you do have a substantial amount of tooth that's below the surface of the gums where it goes down into your jawbone, okay? So like you have a root of your tooth, you have a root of the mountain. So what about erosion of mountains? So remember the Earth's crust floats on top of the denser mantle, and this is related to buoyancy. So erosion removes the upper layers of the rock from the mountains. As rock is removed, the mountains no longer push into the mantle as much as they did before they were starting to be eroded downward. 
So what you get is, cr is crustal uplift. Okay, so you have very large mountains. They're pushing down into the mantle. If you remove some of this material at the top of the mountain, you're not gonna have as much pressure pushing down into the mantle. So then the mountain is gonna like bounce up a little bit and float on the mantle a little higher than it was before because you don't have as, as much weight pushing down. So that, that adjustment of uplift is from buoyancy. So it's a rebound. Okay, so the crust rebounds and becomes uplifted as erosion removes material from the mountains. And this is related to the process that we call isostatic adjustment or isostatic rebound. Ultimately, the land that used to be mountainous will reach equilibrium and actually become relatively flat once again. And we could see this in New York City, where we don't have humongous mountains, the land looks relatively flat. And that's from the adjustment, the isostatic adjustment over time. So isostatic rebound is when you unload the crust related to erosion, and then the crust keeps rising up and then you keep having more erosion, and then eventually the land reaches equilibrium. Okay, so you erode part of the mountain. The, the root of the mountain is gonna bounce or rebound a little bit higher because it's no longer pushing into the mantle as much. And then as you uplift the mountain, you're able to have more erosion and then where does that eroded material go? When you erode off the top of the mountain, that eroded material ends up next to the mountain. So you thicken the area of land next to the mountain and you're lowering or you're lessening the thickness of the actual mountain. So eventually the whole piece of land ends up pretty flat and that's your equilibrium. So here I just have a little diagram here and there to show the process of rebound. So here's a, an empty boat in the water. The boat is high up on the water. If you put a whole lot of heavy things in the boat, the boat's gonna sink lower into the water. And then if you were to remove those items from the boat, the boat is gonna like go back up higher on the water. So that's your rebound, okay? It's just unloading and loading and uplift. And so this is kind of a model of the rebound. Okay, and this shows you further the isostatic rebound. So here you have your mountain and you're going to have erosion. So erosion is going to lower the mountain. The, the height of the mountain is going to get lower. And then you're not pushing down onto the mantle as much, so the root of the mountain is going to rise up a little bit. That's your isostatic rebound. And then you're depositing sediments on the sides of the mountains and that came from the erosion of the mountain. Okay, so you're taking a, the materials off the mountain and then it gets deposited next to the mountain. Okay, so eventually you have this flat area of continental crust. It's relatively flat. And that is more of a normal thickness of the continental crust. So mountains don't even last forever, okay? It's like it's funny when people say things are, are written in stone or like they're set in stone. It's like mountains technically don't even last forever. So it's kind of like a funny concept when people say set in stone. So um, just an interesting thing to think about.
Okay, and then this is just another diagram of the same concept. So you have this young mountain range, and then you have the erosion, the uplift, the continuation of the erosion, the deposition on the sides of the mountain, and then you have the thickness, whoops, the thickness is relatively equal. Okay, it's like a relatively equal thickness going across this whole diagram down here. Okay, so this is a little different because it has the photos. So here you have your young mountains. They're like really humongous mountains. And then you have, it's more like rolling hills. Well, this is more like rolling hills. This is more like smaller mountains. Okay. And then you have your relatively flat land, but it's a little hilly, but it's relatively flat. So, but millions of years ago in this location, the mountains were like this. And the mountains just disappeared. They eroded downward and what we're left with is land that has reached equilibrium. Okay, and then that brings us back to the metamorphic chapter where we had the word exhumation, which was the uplift of the mountains, then you have a collapse of the mountain range, and then you have erosion. So that's all happening as well. And all of these concepts combined allow mountains to get eroded downward and then you ultimately have flat land again and equilibrium. Okay, so that brings us to the next portion of this topic, which is deformation. So before we go into deformation, I want to review what undeformed rock layers look like. So undeformed rock layers are generally going to be in flat layers. So here you have a roadside outcrop where you could see limestone layers, sandstone layers, and shale, and they're flat horizontal layers. So that's the principle of original horizontality, which states that sediments are deposited in horizontal layers. So therefore, sedimentary rocks will form as flat horizontal layers. So if sedimentary rocks are found to be in any other orientation, for example, if the layers of rock are tilted on an angle or they've been folded, that indicates to us that the rocks have gone through deformation. So these layers down here have been folded. They're no longer flat, they're folded. So that tells us there was deformation in the area. Perhaps the deformation was related to tectonic movement. It may have been some sort of collision that happened between two pieces of continental crust. Okay, just looking at this photo, we don't know what the folding is from. We just see that there was deformation. I have a quick question. Yes. How, how can you distinguish between an, um, a deformed rock um, and a metamorphosed rock? Um, that is a good question. So a lot of the defer a lot of the areas where you see deformation, you may also see that the rock is metamorphic. In this photo, these um, we're just going to say that these are sedimentary, but they've been folded. But there were other cases where the deformed rocks are metamorphic. So you would have to know more about the geologic history of that particular area, and you would have to be able to look at the actual rocks and see what type of rocks they are. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So a lot of times there's more, there's more field examinations that go into discussions about certain areas. 
So when you just look at a photo, you're just looking at the photo, you don't really have enough information. But once you delve into more details about where it is and what the geologic history is, and then you actually can look at some samples of the rocks, then you start to get a better idea of what happened. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it did, it did, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. So then this is just another example of rock layers that are horizontal. Now these are sedimentary rock layers in upstate New York. And these, have, these actually formed in an ocean, uh, like a, an ancient sea that covered New York State millions of years ago. There was seawater at some point that covered New York State. And the evidence is these sedimentary layers. We'll get into that more at another lecture. So deformation is any change in shape and or volume of rocks in response to stress. So rocks you may think of as being just like unchangeable, but you can actually change the shape and or the volume of rocks if enough stress is applied to them. So stress is just the forces that are applied to rocks. And strain is the reaction that a rock has to stress. So here's this video modeling the deformation of a stress ball. So deformation can be seen using a stress ball, for example. So I'm squeezing the stress ball, applying stress, and the ball reacts by deforming. And it happens to be this type of material goes back to its original shape when you release that stress. But that's the deformation. It's the reaction to the stress applied. Okay, so basically, when you apply stress to a stress ball, it reacts to the stress that you're applying, which is pretty much why a stress ball is a stress ball. It's made of a material that reacts to your application of a stress force. And it changed shape and volume, right? The ball gets more compacted together when you squeeze it. So that's changing the volume. And you're changing the shape. It becomes more like a flatter, compacted piece. So that's the change in the shape. Okay, and again, the word strain is the reaction that the rock has to the stress. So these are different types of stress. You can have a pushing or a compression stress. And that's what I was doing to the stress ball. I was applying compression. I was squeezing it. You can have tension, which is like a pulling apart stress. And then you could have shear, which is movement in opposite directions, neck, like two different pieces are moving in opposite directions, but next to each other. So that's shear stress. Okay, so compression, tension, and shear. Again, compression is pushing or squeezing, tension is pulling apart, and shear is it's lateral, meaning like next to each other, but opposite directions. And then the, this is showing you what happens when the rocks are shallow, where they're, they're behaving brittily. And this down here is showing you what happens to rocks when they are deep in the ground. So you have faulting when rocks are located close to the Earth's surface, it's all going to be faulting. 
And then deeper down in the ground, you're gonna have folding, stretching, and shearing. So these are different types of strain. Elastic strain is when deformed rocks return to the original shape when the stress is removed. It is not a permanent change. This would be like when I squeezed the stress ball. The stress ball, when I opened my hand, went back to its original shape and size. I did not permanently alter the shape or size, or volume, rather. I did not change any of that about the stress ball. It went back to its original appearance, okay? So that's elastic strain. Plastic strain is when rocks react to stress by folding, and that's a permanent deformation where it stays in the folded shape. This would be more like squeezing a ball of Play-Doh. If you were to squeeze a ball of Play-Doh, after you're done squeezing it, it's gonna stay in the shape that resulted from the squeezing. Okay, so like if you were to make a ball and you smush it onto a table, once you pick your hand up, the Play-Doh will stay in that smushed flat shape. Okay, so that's plastic strain. Permanent deformation. Elastic is not permanent. And then fracturing is when rocks just break, and that's also permanent deformation. So again, these are all different types of strain, which is how rocks react to stress. And again, stress is either compression or squeezing or pushing together, or stretching, which is tension stress, or the shear. Okay, so those are the different types of stress. And these are the types of strain. Now the type of strain that occurs when you're talking about rocks depends on different factors. For example, the kind of stress that is applied. So was it tension, compression, or shear? How long the stress was applied for and how much stress was applied? The rock type affected, for example, was the rock soft sedimentary rock or was it a hard metamorphic rock? So like a soft sandstone versus let's say quartzite, which is very hard. And also the pressure and temperature conditions under which the stress is applied. In other words, the depth beneath the earth's surface. So rocks are more ductile or easily molded or shaped at depth and they're more brittle closer to the surface. Now, ductile rocks exhibit plastic strain before they fracture. Brittle rocks exhibit little or no plastic strain before fracturing. So let's go over some examples. So here is an example of elastic strain here is a tree that had a lot of snow fall on its branches. So now the branches have bent over under the weight of the snow. Now when the snow melts, the branches are going to bounce back up to their original position. You can also model elastic strain by bending a Twizzler. When you bend a Twizzler and then you release your hand, it usually goes back to the straight Twizzler shape. Or you could pull lightly on a rubber band. The rubber band will expand to a larger shape. And then when you release the stress, the rubber band goes back to its original size and shape. Okay, so these are different examples of elastic strain. And again, there's no permanent deformation, no fracturing, no folding. 
And this also would be that stress ball example. Now here's an example of plastic strain. So again, with the Play-Doh example, when you apply stress to a Play-Doh, it will stay in whatever shape you molded it into. That's why Play-Doh is fun to play with because you can model it, you can make little models, you know, make like a little model of a dinosaur or make little like pretend hamburgers, whatever. But it's fun to play with because it exhibits plastic strain. Pieces of plastic, like this little random piece of plastic that came with a package of socks, you can bend it and it stays in that position permanently, unless I apply more stress to bend it back to the original shape. So we consider this permanent because it doesn't just bounce back to the original flat shape. Now, aluminum foil also exhibits plastic strain because you can mold aluminum foil into whatever shape you need. For example, like wrapping it around a sandwich. So this shows you brittle versus ductile underground. So at several kilometers below the Earth's surface, rock layers can fold under high pressures and temperatures. Because deep underground, they behave, the rocks behave in a ductile fashion. If you think of like chewing gum or um, a silly putty, you're able to like, you're able to like pull on it and get it to stretch and fold. That is ductile. Okay, because the rocks down here are at a warmer temperature and they're under more pressure. So they're able to behave in a ductile fashion. Closer to the surface, rocks behave in a brittle fashion and they're more likely to fracture. That's because it's colder closer to the surface and there's less pressure applied. So now this goes back to this diagram where it shows types of stress and it says shallow. Okay, at shallow depths, rocks tend to exhibit brittle fracture. Okay, so you're mainly just going to have fracturing because the rocks are brittle. And at depth, you're able to have more ductile behavior. So you get folding and stretching and shearing, more like playing with chewing gum. Whereas the top is more like playing with a hard pretzel where you just crack it. Okay, so closer to the surface, rocks behave like hard pretzels. Deeper down, rocks behave more like chewing gum. So then we're going to get into fractures in rock. So fractures in ductile rock. A ductile rock um, will exhibit plastic strain. <clears throat> ductile materials react to stress with plastic strain. So here's a paper clip and I deformed it permanently when I applied stress to it. If you continue to bend the paperclip beyond what its internal strength can handle, it will actually fracture. Okay, so ductile rocks will exhibit plastic strain and then fracture. If you reach a threshold of like too much stress. You can also show this with an old credit card. If you bend the plastic it'll bend and then at some point it'll just like start to crack. Okay, so again, ductile rocks will exhibit plastic strain and then fracture if the stress goes past this internal strength. Fractals Fractures in brittle rock. Rocks that are brittle 
will fracture without first exhibiting plastic strain. So that would be more like if you break a piece of chalk or a Kit Kat bar or a hard pretzel, it's gonna crack right away. There's no bending first. Okay, so rocks behave differently if they're deeper down and ductile versus if they are closer to the surface and brittle. Okay. So then we have geologic structures related to deformation. Folds, joints, and faults. So here we have faults. Folds are when rock layers that used to be horizontal have been bent. Folds are a result of compression stress. Again, that's the squeezing or pushing together stress. Folding usually takes place deep in the crust where rocks are more ductile. And this is a monocline, which is one simple bend in the rock layers. Okay, so then if we go back to this diagram here, compression, which is the arrows moving towards each other, the squeezing or pushing together, is related to folding. Okay, so that's your compression stress. Here are some more folds. These beds were once horizontal and constant thickness, and now they have been distorted. Okay, so that's all folding. Here's more folding. Here's more folds, and we have this these terms called anticlines and synclines. So an anticline is when the fold arches upward and a syncline is when the fold is dipping downward. Okay, so like going back here, this would be a syncline. Okay, so the anticline sort of looks like the letter A, right? Looks like the letter A. And a syncline kind of looks like a sink. You know, like in the kitchen, you have a sink, right? That kind of sink. I can't think of another type of sink. That's what I meant though, like a sink. So anyway, syncline looks like a sink. Anticline looks like the letter A. So those are good ways of remembering those words. Okay, anticline, syncline, right? So you end up with this, these folds in this piece of land here. That's one example of how the folds would look. For some reason, this type of folding reminds me of like wrinkles in a carpet like when carpeting is kind of old and it gets wrinkles, right? That's kind of what it looks like. Okay, so here you have your upward arch and here you have dipping downward. Okay, so this diagram on the left is which, an anticline or a syncline? Anticline. That is correct. Yeah, an anticline. And that makes this one a syncline. Okay, so this may help you remember which one is which. Okay, then we have joints. 
Joints are fractures in rocks where no movement has occurred along the fracture. So these are just cracks in the rock, okay? But they don't have movement, like there's no lateral movement or up and down movement. An example of joints would be like columnar jointing in basalt rocks, which we discussed when we did the igneous lecture. And then we have faulting. Faults are fractures in which blocks of rock on opposite sides of the fracture have moved parallel to the fracture surface. So in this case, you have this line is your fault. And then you have this thick rock layer here, and then this thick rock layer here. Now this rock layer here looks very similar to this rock layer here. So you look down here, this like thicker layer down here looks very similar to this thick layer down here. So what I'm interpreting is that this rock layer used to be continuous with this rock layer. It used to be like a stripe that goes across, but now this rock layer is higher up. So this is a fault line where this piece of the, this side of the fault went upward compared to this side of the fault, right? So you can look at different rock layers and then kind of match up where they used to be. And then that gives you an idea of the direction the fault line moves or the rocks moved along the fault line rather. So the first type of fault that we're going to talk about is called a dip-slip fault. That is when all movement is vertical, either up or down, along the fault plane. So we have a normal fault, and that's when one of the sides of the fault, which we're going to call the foot wall, moves up relative to what we call the hanging wall. A reverse fault is when the foot wall moves down relative to the hanging wall. And then a thrust fault is a reverse fault, but it's on a more shallow angle. It's like a more horizontal looking fault. So going back to this diagram, reverse fault looks like this. It's like acute angles like sharp, acute angles, and it looks like the letter Z. Normal faulting has more obtuse angles. Okay, so reverse fault looks like the letter Z, or it could be a backwards Z as well. And then your normal faulting is more like an open looking fault. It's obtuse angle. So we'll get back to this, but it says um, F-U-N and F-T-R. Those are just different ways of remembering. Once I show you what the foot wall and the head wall are, it, those are ways of remembering the, which type of fault is which. Okay, so if you imagine a geologist in the middle of the fault line, where the geologist head is, is your head wall or your hanging wall. And where the geologist's feet are is your foot wall. Okay? So, you can just, I'll just quickly draw a little person here. Okay, that's my little person really quickly. Really quick drawing. Whoops. Okay, so you may, again, you draw a little person on the fault line. The piece of, or the side of the fault where the feet go is the foot wall. The side 
of the fault, which is this white line here, the, the side of the fault where the person's head goes is your hanging wall or the head wall. Okay, and here's another way of looking at it. So here's a little geologist standing on, this is um, a fault line that you can kind of like, um, it's just like one half of the fault line, okay? So I took the foot wall here and I took away the hanging wall, just so you can see. The side that you're able to walk on is the foot wall, okay? Like the side where the feet are gonna go is your foot wall. And then the side where your head is, in this case, this person's like bumping their head gently. I mean, they're not getting hurt, but they're just like bumping their head a little bit. On this piece, that's your hanging wall or the head wall. Okay, so head wall, foot wall. So now going back to this, if the foot wall looks like it moved up compared to the hanging wall, it's a normal fall. And that's foot wall up normal, and it spells out fun. If the foot wall moved down relative to the hanging wall, it's a reverse fault. And you can think of FDR, the president. Okay, so now looking at this diagram here, you can draw in your little geologist. Okay, so this side that I'm scrolling the cursor on, the little, the little uh, mouse cursor, is this your foot wall or your head wall? Foot wall. Correct. Okay, so this is the foot wall. Okay, foot wall. Okay, so then you go back and look at these rock layers here. Now, did this rock layer look like it moved up or down compared to this rock layer here? It moved down. Wait. This, this rock layer here on the foot wall, does it look like it moved up or down compared to this on the head wall? Oh, I see, it moved up. Okay, correct. See how, yeah, this rock layer is now higher up compared to where it used to be. And this is your foot wall. So then we go back here. If the foot wall moved up, it's a normal fault. So this is a normal fault. Normal fault. Okay. So you just draw your little geologist cartoon, you determine where the foot wall is, and then you see if you could tell if it moved up or down compared to the other side of the fault, which is the head wall. And then that goes back here, the same thing. The foot wall moved up, so this is a normal fault.